And let's talk now, I should say, to Ian Wright, who's the chairman of the Business uh, Committee, who joins us now. Ian, now your committee's report today is absolutely well, blasting, uh, very, very critical of, uh, of what Mike Ashley had to say. Um, you're not entirely convinced he was telling you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, aren't you? Uh, morning, Julia. Well, yeah, you know, that's slightly sort of unfair. What <laughs> I'd say is that I think it's a very balanced um, report. I think it's very critical because, frankly, that reflects the appalling conditions that workers at Sports Direct find themselves in. Now, you said yourself, you know, he's the fa Mike Ashley is the founder, he's the majority shareholder of Sports Direct. It's very much fashioned in his in image. You know, when you think about Sports Direct, you do think about Mike Ashley, and by all accounts, he's very much a hands-on boss. He's got a desk in the center of the warehouse at Chybrook. He's there at least once a week. We find it somewhat incredible that he didn't know what was going on. Now, having said that, what we, where we do accept what he said to us in front of the committee is Sports Direct has been run very much as a one-man band still. It was set up by Mr. Ashley as a sole trader. And it's very much still run like that. It's got too big for him. And we're recommending that actually he needs to look at the governance, the corporate governance, the management arrangements. This is the biggest um, sporting retailer in the country. It can't be run as a fiefdom by one person. It needs to have proper controls in place. Well, you've likened uh, the conditions to Victorian workhouse conditions, so one trade union boss likened the conditions to a Soviet gulag. Uh, things that you, you, in terms of evidence that you heard, in terms of the mistreatment of workers, workers promised uh, permanent jobs in return for sexual favours, numerous ambulant calls out, uh, including one for a woman <coughs> who gave birth in a toilet, a very extraordinarily ruthless six strikes and you're out policy for staff penalised uh, for, for small things like taking a quick break to get a glass of water, or taking time off when ill. Um, these are extraordinary things, and you say not stuff that we would expect at a time when we are supposed to have so much protection at work. That's true. Um, and one of the things that we're very concerned about is, you know what, there's employment legislation, there's protection for workers in law. That's what we in Parliament do. We set that. But you can have the best laws in the world. If they're not enforced, if they're not complied with, well, they mean nothing, do they? And so it's the case of making sure that these big bosses don't hold the enforcement agencies in contempt. You know, the big fear that we would have is that, you know, a big boss, a billionaire could say, do you know what, I'm saving millions by undercutting and disregarding employment legislation. I'm saving myself millions, and I'll get some paltry fine of 10 or 20,000 pounds. You know, I can just, I can pay that off in seconds. Um, Enforcement agencies like HMRC, like the Health and Safety Executive, have to have proper resources, they have to have proper teeth, so the big bosses are frightened of them and want to put in place yeah. actual law. That's the key point. Well, exactly. But the fines need to be huge to make it not worth their while. But again, this is the interesting thing, particularly in the case of, of the warehouse that they've got, is that you know, they are the major employer in the area. A lot of these uh, people are, are, are who they employ uh, don't have many qualifications, don't have any other job opportunities. And basically, it's a question of like it or lump it. And if you don't accept the conditions he wants people to work under, zero hours contracts for virtually everybody, no guarantee of a minimum number of hours work. Now, that's totally legal, but we did discover during your committee's proceedings that, uh, that, that, that for people, because of the number, amount of time that they were having to be, uh, have faced searches to check they hadn't been stealing from the warehouse, um, that, that, and that was unpaid time, they were effectively on below minimum wage. Now, he's had to adjust that because that is a clear breach of, of, of the law. Um, but, but in terms of other things, like the six strikes and you're out, it, you know, is that against the law? Can they be penalised for that? I think what we, it's not necessarily against the law, but it's a sort of big question about, well, what sort of country do we want to live in? Now, I believe in good, successful companies making money. Profit is not a bad word. Um, but that shouldn't be on the back of exploitation. You know, we had these debates centuries ago, Julia. You know, people um, campaigned in terms of the appalling conditions in factories. In Victorian times, we stop people going down chimneys, you know, in terms of making sure that there's a dignity and respect when it comes to people working. I fear that when we're squeezing margins, there's a race to the bottom when it comes to workers' rights. And those who are vulnerable, who are perhaps no skilled or low skilled, who are underpaid, are going to bear the brunt of this. That's not the sort of economic 
successful business model that I want to see Britain deploy in the 21st century. No, indeed, and even if that was a model, you know, and it's always going to be cheaper to employ someone in Bangladesh or Sri Lanka. But the reality is, um, the, the, this is a man who's made billions of pounds. The, the man is a self-made billionaire. And I suppose as someone who most definitely isn't a billionaire or a millionaire, what I wonder about is why the need to squeeze these tiny margins to exploit people, to use people and treat them so badly um, for that extra that extra few million when you know you, you're already living the life of Riley what, what what's what's the what do you think the motivation is there um uh, you know I don't know you'd have to ask Mike Ashley that but I do think you make a really important point Julia which is in terms of what's gone wrong not just with this country we're seeing it in America we're seeing it in a lot of western democracies where you've got the proceeds of growth the proceeds of success accumulating to a very, very small number of people. These people are accumulating, you know, un, un, you know, wealth that we can't even imagine, billions and billions of pounds, whilst at the same time squeezing workers to the point where we've seen in the report today where people have not even been paid the national minimum wage. That sort of huge inequality causes resentment. One of the arguments that you could say about the EU referendum result is that people are angry that this country is not working properly for them, for ordinary people. And it's a case of, we do need to do something about this. As I said, I'm the first person. I want to see successful businesses employing large numbers of people making money. I think profit is a good thing, but not when it's at the back, on the back of vulnerable um, people who are exploited and who the law doesn't apply to. That's not right. No, and indeed, of course, he's doing other companies out of business who do treat their workers well uh, and do do we have people on proper contracts and, 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 and treat them as you know, valued human be beings and, and, and therefore they can't compete because uh, he's, he's, he's cutting those margins. And look, and I'm somebody who's guilty of buying stuff from sports. I look around and think, oh, we need to buy some, some equipment or ski equipment or something. You think, oh, do you know what? Look, oh, it's half the price on Sports Direct. And, uh, and in a way that, you know, they haven't they had a wonderful set of, of advertising about all of this. But, um, but just finally, can I ask you, Ian, um, you, you sat for many hours uh, with uh, um, uh, this, this man, Mike Ashley, this infamous uh, man sitting in front of you. What did you personally make of him? I thought he was, I thought he was honest in many respects. I thought he was open. And actually, I'd go so far, Julian, to say I thought he was engaging. Um, one of the disappointments I've got is he did every he did his level best not to come before us you know he was dragged kicking and screaming to us it took five months for us to get him there but once he was there he opened up and I just regret that it's taken half a year when we could have been improving conditions at workers uh, at workers at sports direct um, to actually be implemented we've wasted half a year um, I hope that he works with us in the future um, I will be critical if he doesn't put in place recommendations, but I'll also praise him if he thinks, you know what, I'm going to change my ways. We've got to stop these real exploitation examples of workers. But, but if he's only changed his ways because of the, uh, the, the bad press and the embarrassment, no doubt for, no doubt for Mrs. Ashley uh, and the like, um, it's interesting, your first word you, you used there was, was, was honest. Because I, although I, I thought he did a great performance, I think he did the only thing he could do, yeah, I very much got the impression watching it that it was a performance and that he had been, he had, he had sat down with PR people for three days beforehand, going through word by word and how, and how it, what demeanour he should, no, no, he should adopt and the like. It, it felt to me like a very dishonest performance. Yeah, well, do you know what, I disagree with you to some extent because what came out and what, one of the reasons I used the word honest in a very deliberate way was, you know, he, he said to us, he actually said to us, you know, I'm going against all the advice that I got from that, my PR that's, people. That's, that's you know. a PR trick. Well, maybe I'm being a bit naive and <laughs> idealistic there, but I actually believed him. I took that at face value. Um, I thought that he was sort of, once he got into his stride, he said what, what, he, what came out of, you know, first thing that entered his head, to be honest. Um, I do think that he was open. As I said, I do want to work with him in the future. I do find it somewhat incredible that he didn't know what was going on, given how much he controls uh, the company. But ultimately, we, you know, we can't have business practices like that in Britain in this modern age. Absolutely. Well, keep up the good work on the committee, uh, bringing people to account. Ian Wright, he's chair of the Business Innovation and Skills Committee. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us here at Talk Radio this morning.